Well, my name is Travis Doucette, and I am so excited to be here today with Randy Rothwell. Uh, Randy is a beloved worship leader on some of Integrity Music's most popular recordings in the Hosanna Music series. And he is one of the earlier worship leaders to play his instrument, acoustic guitar player, on some of his albums, and uh, just really kind of ushered in that acoustic sound in the 90s. Randy, it is great to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. Well, Randy, for those who may not be familiar with your ministry, can you share a little bit about how you came to faith and your denominational background and how you got involved in worship leading? Yeah, I uh, grew up uh, in western Kentucky, a town called Paducah, and uh, our little family went to the Methodist church as far as I can, as long back as I can remember, uh, I always went to church, Sunday school occasional VBS, that kind of thing. So I, it was all part of who we were. And I learned a lot of about God and tunes and hymns and prayers and things just growing up in that. Uh, then as I, when I was 13, my father died suddenly and mm -hmm. I kind of got a little ticked off at God, why'd that happen? And I kind of pulled away from all that. And, you know, you're 13 anyway, you kind of get a little bit exploratory and rebellious from what you knew before and I, I had a couple of years there where I was just uh, not interested didn't make any sense and all that and then some folks came into through Paducah from the tail end of the Jesus movement out in California you know with uh, where all the surfers and hippies and musicians were really getting turned on to Jesus and it was very different they came came through and showed a film a documentary film about that and sang some songs and preached a little bit different message than what I'd heard more about Jesus being personal and really being part of your whole life, just fully committed to him. Anyway, long story short, I really responded a lot to the music, but to that message and kind of really opened my heart fully to Jesus started following him as a ninth grader, 14 years old. Hmm. Uh, I, I had been teaching myself guitar. I'm not a trained musician. I, I have a a great ear and I've always taught myself every instrument I play um, and have since learned music theory and everything by by knowing how to do it and then learning how to explain what I'm doing but in the beginning I just had like a Mel Bay chord book you know yeah cowboy chords and uh, and a Beatles Beatle song book of course James, James Taylor and that kind of stuff and that, that's how I learned to play and uh, I got sort of uh by default, I kind of became sort of the guitar player in this little uh, youth happening thing that was going on in Kentucky uh, because the main guy that had been playing guitar, he was there for a while from California, then he left. And they found out I could play. And I was a real shy kid, but I just got pulled up there on the stool uh, in front of everybody sitting on the on the floor, you know, and, and learning to play these songs. And this guy that would lead the songs would just, he didn't sing that great, but he'd just start the songs. He didn't wait for me to give him a key or know what song. Just start the song, and I would just slide up and down the neck and find a root, start playing in F sharp. And I learned how to play in every every key by ear by doing that. And that was kind of my beginning of playing uh, Christian music and choruses and scripture songs and all that kind of stuff in the early 70s. Wow. Yeah. Who, who were some of the uh, early CCM artists or, or even, I, I know a worship industry as we know it today didn't exist back then, but who were some of the Christian artists that you were listening to that maybe influenced your playing and your singing? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I loved, uh, the first real CCM album I had was the Love Song album. Yeah. So I did a Love Song and all those early, the Everlasting Living Jesus music concert, yeah. all those early Calvary Chapel things that had The Way and uh, Mustard Seed Faith and all this kind of, I had those. And then I was also really, <laughs> really, I learned how to play the piano by listening to Larry Norman's bootleg album. Yeah. Thinking, you know, I can do that. You know, it's just real simple stuff and triads. And anyway, a lot of those things influenced me in, in the beginning. And, uh, I, you know, living in just two hours from Nashville, I had all of that influence of, of gospel. And the Archers was a big group when yeah. we started. We started a band uh, a couple of years out later from this incident I'm talking about. And the Archers were kind of a model. We liked that sound. So we did that. That's so great. I was fortunate to see Larry Norman before he passed away when, when I was a kid, of course. And uh, I had a cousin who was deep into Larry Norman. So 
I remember the first time here and only visiting this planet and upon this rock and so long ago, the guy yeah, yeah. in yeah. another land. I remember listening to those tapes and thinking, wow, this is this guy. This guy is a real deal. Yeah. Um, I, I also noticed that uh, Keith Green's drummer, Bill Maxwell, played on the B Magnifier. Yeah, that yeah, must yeah, be a yeah. Treat. That was. I mean, early in those days, like I'm talking about, I mean, Andre Crouch saw him play and, and, and I remember they, them on the Tonight Show, Bill Maxwell. When I finally met him, it's like it's like this person I'd always kind of idolize as a drummer. You know, he's fantastic. Yeah, it's it incredible. Was, it was. Well, bring us back to the beginning. How did you first hear about Integrity Music, and what's the story behind how you were first recruited to lead on the Mighty Warrior Project in 1987? Yeah. Well, to be honest, I was as surprised as as anyone. I mean, I I was like so many people that are probably listening to this. I I got the tapes. Uh, I was a worship leader in the church and I was just consuming songs. What's another new song? What's a great song? And you're listening back back in the day. And I know Tom alluded to this in his his talk with you. But back in the day, you just got somebody came back from a conference or somebody had a scratchy little cassette tape and you were trying to stick ear phones in and listen really close and hear what the melody was and learn songs. <laughs> and, and, and then I, I got them from... Um, Christ for the Nations used to record their chapels and uh, some stuff coming out of Tulsa and Portland, yeah. Bible Temple and all that. Those were sources. But then when Integrity Music came out, there's this really quality tape with great songs. And I was just getting them and listening to them and learning songs like, like so many other people. And uh, the interesting story is that what happened is in 1982, I formed a little publishing company just to kind of have a container to hold some of the songs that were coming out of the, the churches I was a part of. Okay. And a, a lot of these people that you'll know, these were people involved in the ministry, Linda Shazo, John Sellers, yeah. uh, Phil White, uh, Mark Koch, uh, Tim Picking, all these people, Craig Turner, they were all people in the ministry that I was in. And I was trying to look for a way to hold on to these songs and uh, get them out to people because the way songs got out, sometimes they got out incorrectly. People were singing the wrong yes. melody. and work. So it, we wanted to kind of def, have a definitive version that got out. And so I'd created this little publishing company and I'd recorded this little album in 1982. I was just learning about engineering. I went to a full sale school when it was just starting. Sure. I think I had a six week course you could go through, you know, just learning about engineering and recording and did this little album called Possess the Land. Okay. And uh, it had some of those, those songs on it. And, uh, I, so I, the point of this long story is that I had this company that that owned the copyrights of several songs. Well, Integrity right. was trying to trace down the copyright to a song called Go Forth, Go Forth. It was one of those, you know, cut time Hebrew things, you know, yeah. go forth, go forth into the right field. And uh, a friend of mine, Bob Mason, Robert E. Mason, it's listed on copyrights that way, but Bob Mason, he had written that. And, and so Garrett Gustafson, who was the A&R yes. person at the time, great friend, lifelong friend of mine. In fact, I'm going to see him in two weeks. Um, he he contacted me about that copyright and, and he wanted to come down and, and <clears throat> see me. And so we were doing a conference in the New Orleans area and he was in Mobile, just a couple hours away. He drove down, we had lunch, he talked with me and, uh, you know, I signed over that song for them to, to use. And, uh, and while he was there at the conference to talk to me, he heard me leading worship before a speaker, and he really liked that. And, and so he said, we'd like to also invite you to be a worship leader. I was like, mm. me? me? You know, you want me to? I, I was just surprised. Uh, yeah, we, we think you, it's great, and we love the songs you guys have. And so the, they've, they said, we'll fly you up to St. Louis. We'll meet at Tom's house, and we'll introduce you to everybody, and we'll listen to, bring a handful of songs, and we'll go from there. So I brought a bunch of songs that were coming from our ministry, including those, you know, some Linda Shazo songs. And in fact, I think she had more precious than silver that was kind of getting traction, but most people didn't know her other songs. I introduced a, a boatload of songs of hers to integrity. But um, but I brought all these songs and they loved them. And we put this thing together and it, it just sort of became uh this kind of warfare theme, I guess, because that's kind of what was going on at the time in the ministry I was in. Everything was just kind of like, you know, possess the land, take the kingdom. Everything was just a fight. Everything was a fight. We were picking fights. So uh, it was all this military kind of thing. I just be, kind of became 
the theme as we were putting songs together. They didn't come out saying, we want to do a Mighty Warrior album. And, you know, it was just, what songs do you have? And I just do, I, this is a funny story too. I remember um, the song, Lift High the Lord and Mighty Warrior. Mighty Warrior, I think Integrity had actually recorded that earlier on something. Uh, but I said, well, I found this song at a conference in Tulsa, it's Lift High the Lord. And it was in this, they presented this cantata and mm -hmm. the guy who wrote it and the guy who sang it, it was, it was really odd that I would even like the song because it was, it kind of came across kind of like the wizard, the line in the Wizard of Oz. It was like, Lift High the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I thought it was a good song somehow through that. And we stuck them together with that and, and Mighty Warrior. And they liked that. Of course, Tom took it and made a great arrangement together with it. But, but all the songs we put together, it just became that uh, warrior theme. You know, it had a lot of energy and spiritual warfare and all that. So That's I kind of got I kind of got pegged as the as the warfare guy, although that really wasn't totally my nature, but. That's great. What was the name of the publishing company that you started? Well, in, in the beginning, it was Vision Records. And you'll see yeah. that on Mighty, Mighty Warrior. And then somebody else had a similar thing, Vision Music or something. And so I changed it to Sounds of Vision, which I thought was a more clever name. You know, Sounds and Vision. Sounds of Vision. And you'll see that on later later copyrights. Like on, um, on, might be on Army of God. But later on, uh, songs were yeah. Sounds of Vision. You yeah. mentioned um, you mentioned John Sellers, and uh, you know my understanding is I've been doing my research. Uh, so uh, prior to Integrity properly recording like their first record, um, Tom shared with me that you know they distributed Behold His Majesty, and I have reason to believe too they also struck up some kind of distribution deal with uh, Let Praise Arise because that was kind of released um under independently the, yeah, yeah in, independently but but it was released as part of the hosanna it, at least was distributed mm -hmm. um as as one i've seen the cover as like a hosanna integrity release but actually in my in my record collection i have the original, original with, yeah. you know, on birdwing which is an imprint of sparrow mm -hmm. and uh second chapter of x sings on that and Harry yeah. that ward and you were crowned with many crowns and a lot of great songs yeah. on that what, what was your um what was your interaction with John? I, I don't know really anything about him or where he's from. How did you get connected with him? Well, at the time he was in Paducah and he, and, okay. uh, he, he was in the, in the church I came from. I think maybe by that time I had moved to Florida, but uh, trying to, trying to remember. But anyway, but John, I knew him from way back and uh, he was always uh, very uh, entrepreneurial, very, he had a lot of ideas and he was doing things and he, Somehow I got connected with Last Days Ministry and all that out there. He just decided he was going to, he had some songs and he was going to go do, do something. So I, by that time, I wasn't that close to him. I had kind of lost touch, but, but he went out and did that. And I was like, good for you, man. Good job. He had yeah. some great people on it and he had great songs. Um, uh, you know, so yeah, I was happy to see that come out. But, but I, I think I was surprised when it came out because I was just getting the tapes, you know, and I was like, hey, that's, John, that's John's. I knew a lot of those songs already, but yeah, we uh, I grew, I grew up in Canada and we sang You Were Crowned with Many Crowns, that was oh, yeah. the one that kind of made it north, and that was uh, you know, that ding 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 ding. Yeah, he, he was uh, he was a very much like Keith Green type of piano player, he played real hard, yeah, like he was like when he came in the room and played, you knew he was there, he wasn't just in the background, he was just. <laughs> He's kind of a bigger guy and he just really punches it. You know? I love so, that. I love yeah. that. Is he is he still with us? Is he around? He's around. In fact, I, I haven't kept up with him, but I just saw well, actually thinking about it, I just kind of Googled him. So I mean, yeah, he's still doing he's still recording stuff. Good for him. Good for not him. Sure, not sure where he's living, but <laughs> Well, yeah, I think, um, you know, that John, the John Sellers Let Praise Arise album and then the Behold His Majesty project that they did out of Tom's uh, you know Tom's church. I think um, kind of like unsung heroes of getting integrity established because it was it was through testing the market with those records that they yeah. discovered. Oh, people are hungry for this. Let's start. Yeah. You know, Mike and Ed are just like let's 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 record these records and and use this uh, subscription model to get them out. So mm -hmm. I wanted to play a couple of tracks from uh, Mighty Warrior. The first uh -oh. one was a song <laughs> I remember when I was a kid. Um, oh, no. and, th and this is, I guess, those that are watching, should should we should preface this by saying there was a great zeal and interest in Hebrew sounding minor songs in the late oh. 80s and 90s. You know why? One of the reasons? You yeah, can tell just, me. 
keep that groove going. You could do like six songs in a row and just keep the vibe going. That's what Med- it was all about. Medley maker. So, <laughs> That's so right. here we go. This is Blow the Trumpet in Zion. you want to dance <laughs> totally so what memories come flooding back to you when you hear that uh, a couple of things uh one craig turned again he was in our our, our ministries and they wrote that song and it was a big conference song it sort of escaped back in those days you know there weren't there wasn't really a network to get songs out so much but i always said the songs were kind of like puppies in your in your arms and they just kind of escaped and they ran somewhere and uh, people would pick them up. And Phil Driscoll picked up that song and did it. And Kenneth Copeland on the album. And actually, when they, when the people who who published their stuff finally found out I had held the copyright, I got a check in the mail one day, and I was just shocked. Well, I didn't do anything with this. You know, it's just, it just made some money. It's like, who's doing this? It's like, wow, this song is getting out there. Another reason I thought we should probably capture our songs and get them out to people the proper way. But anyway, that, that's one thing. Uh, the thing was, I was laughing, listening to that recording. Uh, think of what other songs do you hear Castanets in? The Lord utters his book. The only thing that it reminds me of is like early Phil Spector, Be My Baby, you know, that kind of <laughs> stuff. That, that's the only other stuff that you really hear Castanets in or, you know, international music. Now, I, I heard uh, you talking to, or Tom mentioned it on his thing. There was a little controversy later on about that song. And what it was is I believe... The scripture is actually saying, uh, talking about the enemy coming. They they rush on the cities. They run on the wall. Oh, I see. But great is the army of curse. But the way the song was written, it was like, we, the army of God, we're rushing, we're taking. And that's kind of the mentality it was back then. So that was a little, that's what people had an issue with. They thought, you're taking it out of context. You're taking it wrong. But, I mean, it served the purpose of what it was doing. It was in, in encouraging and invigorating the people of God that you can do it, you know, that kind of thing. You know, um, you mentioned something that I think is important for those who might be listening to this to understand just because it's a lifetime and a world, a different world than what we live in today. You know, music is distributed through digital formats and it's instantaneous. Um, but I, you know, I'm old enough, you're old enough to remember the time where you would go to church conferences and that's how you would learn new songs and just mm-hmm. To underscore the point of what you were saying about, um, you know, how songs were like puppies and that they would escape, <laughs> um, you know, you'd go, I, I have memories, the first time I ever heard Shouts of the Lord was from a conference. Mm-hmm. And you would hear that and you'd, you know, you'd rush up to the worship leader afterward and say, do you have a chart for that? Is, yeah. is that, oh, that, let me go to the Xerox machine and I'll make yeah. it copies, yeah. right? Right? All right, yeah. And, and you take the chart back hoping that you, long before, you know, recordable, de- portable devices that could record things, hoping that you remembered the melody. And, and you know, you, you strum it on your guitar, playing on your piano, you're trying to remember what it was that you heard at the conference. And if you're really lucky, you would buy uh, the cassette tape of the session that it was used in. Yeah. And like you said, you try to listen to that fuzzy tape and try to, oh, yeah, 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 that's how that goes. So let me... Yeah, because uh, in the beginning, uh, people didn't put the music on conference tapes because... Or in the beginning, they did. Because yeah. they, they weren't worried about copyrights. Copyrights, yeah. All that. Yep. But, yeah. One more from the Mighty Warrior Project. You had mentioned this song. Um, this is the title track. Let's uh, Let's have a quick listen. <laughs> So 
you, you just can't. Uh, you, what I appreciate about some of these songs is, um, you know, say what you will about the militant theme. The songwriting is is bullseye with it the whole way to you know commander in chief bring us to attention mm -hmm. like the theme is carried out completely in the lyric do you remember who wrote that song i think that is uh debbie grafsma whom i've never met but i think it was just a you know i don't want to talk out of turn but i think she was just sure. a, an average housewife she wasn't anything pursuing music just wrote a song you know a bunch Love of songs that. i think but, um but uh was I going to say? Oh, you, may, you notice how in those early, early, early tapes, uh, they were really downplaying the worship leader. So you don't oh. even really hear the voice of the person leading any. You hear a female, uh, the soprano, more yeah. in the mix. Uh, that's one reason we we're all yelling and everything, just to kind of interject a little something you could see. Yeah. Some person, her personality, and you know, just. But, and uh, I, I love that about your personality. When I listen to, I've been reviewing some of your projects in preparation for the interview. And just so much enthusiasm, like it, yeah. it just feels so natural, you know, to be led and be like, hey, come on, church, let's get excited about these things. I just I just love the expressiveness of that. Um, any interesting or entertaining stories from the night that that project was recorded? I, I, I'm trying to put myself in your shoes. You've kind of been thrust into this whole like you, you want me to record a project like where was it recorded? What do you remember about the yeah. night? Yeah, again, I, I was just I, I was just thrilled that they they invited me and were so open and I was very it's very validating you know uh I didn't necessarily get a lot of that you know uh and also somebody from the outside who doesn't know me and saying wow really I I really appreciate your gift and you've got something that we want to you know bring it to a broader audience and I was like wow so we went up there um it was recorded back in those days they just did the tracks in the studio and then you would sing it live in front of uh, uh church congregation or choir but this is this was i think was at a 13 and it was 1987 so we did it and the whole thing was done in tom's house so tom had a split level house in in uh, st louis studios in the, in the basement and in the living room there's hardwood floors had a piano and everything and it was a pretty big open concept kind of thing and so he had i'm going to say 75 people or so from the St. Louis area, probably from the Grace Church or people that he knew, they all came in. And that was the the audience, the choir, the the congregation. They were just in his room and they overdubbed them like three times to make it sound bigger, you know. But what happened as I was still there because I was staying in the back bedroom in his house and we were recording these things in the day. And this was an evening, but uh, I was I remember I was up and I stood up on the sort of the the bottom port portion of the fireplace, brick fireplace. And I was just trying to, you know, excite people with, you know, facial expressions and things just because they're just got their headphones on and they're, they're singing. And after a while you get tired. And so I was just kind of cheerleading a little bit. And uh, his daughter, Becky, was a little toddler at the time, Tom's daughter. She had like a little, I think it was like a cat mask, like Halloween or something. And I put this thing on and they're thinking, mighty or, and I get a cat face. I'm like, you know, jumping around and they puts a smile in their face when they're singing and it brightens everything up and <laughs> we did some of that but that was that's fun. so funny i so, also remember that's where i met charlie and jill leblanc they were in that uh group sing and uh, they were great people you should interview yeah. them they're good yeah, charlie charlie did a, a one or two integrity projects i think yeah well. yeah he did that's great and and so this wasn't recorded at a church this was just no um, no. This, no so did you play acoustic guitar on this project i did not i didn't play on anything until be magnified okay and be magnified was really more who i was and the way i led worship with my guitar live and so i played on that yeah but the, originally he again he was doing them so fast yeah. he just used his people that he knew in the studio and he get the tracks and then he, what they're trying to really capture was what happens when people hear these songs and sing along that's what they're capturing so right uh when you think of the songs that resonated, you know, when you're out on the road leading worship, probably using songs from that record, um, what what are the songs that you remember resonating with people off of Mighty Warrior? Uh, I'm trying to think what's on there. Uh, uh, well, all, all the, you know, when you're doing it, I would I would travel to not only to churches and conferences, but I'd do some of these summer outdoor festivals. Okay. You know, creation and 
Atlanta Fest and Kingdom Bound in Western yes. New York. I did yep. that up for 17 years. I was a worship leader up there. But uh, all those, all those Hebrew kind of thing from Mighty Warrior. I'll, you know, yeah. I think that's a medley that ends with "Blow a Trumpet in Zion." It's like yeah. God of Israel is mighty and yeah. something else, and arise, praise His name, or something. Anyway, those those would be big because it, it's energetic and it and it continues on three songs. And if you're not into it in the beginning, you're into it by the end. Sure. But also the real worship ballads, uh, you know, "Joy of My Desire." And the song Glory to the Lamb at the very yes. end. I, I heard that again at a conference in Tulsa. I heard this guy up there playing the piano and singing the song. And I thought, very simple, but very moving. And when when the whole crowd is singing this simple words, glory. Oh, how did it go? Glory, glory, glory to the Lamb. Remember that? Yes, that, yeah, the album yeah, yeah. Ends. that was popular. Because it's so singable and so worshipful. And whose song was that? Do you remember who composed that? I think, is it Larry something? I don't remember his last name. It's just a guy. Again, I, I went to a conference in Tulsa called the Worship Symposium. Okay. With the two brothers, Barry and Steve Griffin. These guys put on these worship conferences back in 1984. And this guy was leading. His name was Larry. It's a bigger, bigger guy sitting at the piano. That's all I remember. I brought Lift High the Lord and Glory, Glory to the Lamb back from that conference from that conference and it That's went on the record mm -hmm. well we, we mentioned this earlier we talked just about your enthusiasm that you're kind of known for on these on these projects where does that come from and how was that cultivated in your leadership style well to be real honest uh I'm, you, you meant you mentioned you were shy so i'm just yeah, trying to I, was gonna, yeah I was gonna say uh, to be real honest i i'm more of an introvert i'm uh I used to say I'm a, an introvert who learned extroverted skills in order to function. You know, uh, I'm really more reserved. I'm not really normally that way. Uh, in the beginning, the songs kind of put you in the mode you need to be in. But also, be real, real honest. The Mighty Warrior really you can hear a, a, a little template of of my homage to Ken Henry. I was very mm -hmm. influenced when I met him, and I did a bunch went to a bunch of his conferences and I stayed in his home and I, he, he was a good friend and uh, all hell King Jesus. I remember when I first heard all hell King Jesus, I said, you mean this is a look. I didn't understand about overdub and post-production. I said, this is a local church recording of their worship. I quit. It was like, I can't do it any better than that. Good night. I'm, I'm, I'm in the little leagues here. So it was like, it was so good. And he was real energetic. And I think, subconsciously a lot of it i thought i need to step up be bigger than i am so i was kind of thinking i needed to be that that's what people expected and the songs kind of demanded that but in real life i'm more like be magnified and which has a lot of energy on it but it takes a while to open up you know yeah. <laughs> but that's more who i am or who i became in the beginning i think i i felt like i needed to be bigger than maybe who I really was. And to a certain extent, worship leaders do need to do that. When you step into that role, mm. it's not about you. It's about what you're doing to serve the congregation. So sometimes you have to be a little different than you normally are just to, just to make it, to sell it, make it come yeah. across. Well, yeah. When you think about, you know, the way that we're talking right now, isn't the way that we would talk if we right. needed to command a room of like, right. you know, 50, 500, 5,000 people, yeah. you, know? you need right. to, you need to adjust your communication style. Right. Exactly. Well, let's move to your second project with Integrity Music and listen to a track from there. This is Jesus, Jesus, Glorious One. Thank you. 
listening to that, um, a couple of thoughts. When I hear uh, that, first of all, I'm, contextually for, for that music series and at that time, that song feels a little bit more aggressive. And uh -huh. the acoustic guitar is in, more in the mix, which is why, why I thought you might have played, you know, you clarified that you didn't, but I thought, man, this feels like the more kind of be magnified direction, you know, because I can hear the acoustic guitar. And, and Tom, the producer of those projects, obviously a, a great keyboard player. Um, so, so that's the first thing that I noticed. But, but this is well, from... First of all, I, I, I may correct myself. I, I may have overdubbed something, and I don't remember oh. on Mighty Warrior, but uh, on, on Army of God, I did play a... Was that on Army of God? Yeah, that's from Army of God. Oh, I did overdub guitar on that. I didn't play it live. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, because that's very much... That sounds like my, my strumming yeah, style. Yeah, it does. Yeah. So, the, you know, this is 1988, one year later. What Like, Integrity comes back to you and says, let's do another one. Um, yeah. What what brought about that second invitation, and what are your memories of preparing for Army of God, choosing the songs, all of that? Uh, again, I was I was surprised they asked me again. Really, I was, like, the person went really? well, I guess. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> you're talking to me, and uh, it's like uh, I I don't remember. I distinctly remember the the meeting and songs and everything for Mighty Warrior. I don't remember the Army of God, so I'm I'm surmising that maybe. We had so many songs we presented at Army of God that they had them in the in the bag. And as they started looking at another album, there's a lot of these uh, Army military theme were coming up. And they said, well, who's the guy to do that? Let's get Randy. So they asked me to do another one. Uh, again, I was thrilled. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, and it, it had all these military, Army, spiritual warfare songs again. So they called it Army of God. But I don't remember going to a planning session where I was bringing more songs there. I could be right. wrong, but it's been a while. <laughs> was um was this also kind of like a studio recorded record or was this one done? No, the, the tracks, of course, were done. And then this was recorded down in Mobile in the Covenant Church, which is the, was the main church that Mike and Ed Linquist went to. And, oh, okay. Uh, Integrity came out of, the magazine came out of that church. So... It was just their home church. So again, my friend Garrett Gustafson, who is, I think he's 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 kind of the unsung hero on a lot of this. He he was the, my introduction to it, and he's and he had a lot of songs on the early records because he had a lot of great songs. Yeah, only uh, by grace. Da, 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 yeah, da, da, da. yeah, those are great songs. Uh, among them, he's still writing today. He's just a great great guy. Very influential in my life at that time, but. Um, Anyway, they were there. So it was a great night and uh, it was packed out. And I remember it was very hot in there because it's in the summer, you usually record them. You have to turn the air off so you don't hear the blowers. So, so when you take the break, it's sweaty in there. You know, we used to say we lived, when I, I lived in Mobile for a while. We used to say we lived in LA, lower Alabama. So <laughs> it was hot down in LA. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Do you remember uh, any memories of the players on this record? Was this Tom's regular kind of uh, crew that he was using for these projects? I, I think so. I think so. I don't remember anybody. I you think it was, you know, Carl and Leanne and yeah. all, the, all the original St. Louis crew. I was going to say, too, just uh, you said you, you heard more aggressiveness and some yeah. there were sort of demarcations that happened, not because of me, but just the, the ones, the the albums that I did. So Mighty Warrior, Hosanna 13, was the first one with the torn paper art. Oh, really? Okay. Uh -huh, uh -huh. They shifted right there. And also, I remember that um, Tom was really influential in taking this kind of music, which was mainly independent, charismatic, Pentecostal, Assembly of God mm -hmm. kind of people did that sort of music. But Tom and his arrangements brought some of these things to the Baptist world and to the yeah. more denominational world. And I remember... Lift, they did Lift High the Lord and Mighty Warrior with a procession and banners and everything in a major Baptist conference out in California. Wow. And now that was groundbreaking. Back yeah. when he, he did that because now you think, I mean, it used to be you wouldn't see electric guitar or drums in a Baptist worship, maybe a concert, but not in a worship. But now it's commonplace, you know. And uh, he, he really segued that whole thing. I think that's really important historically. It, it reminded me of a conversation I had with Don Moen when Don shared with me like his. Um, 
the musicals he did, God With Us, God For Us, they, he was sharing with me that they were an attempt to kind of realize some of the contemporary versions of integrity music in maybe more safe arrangements, more orchestral right. to make them orchestral. more Orchestral, yeah. yeah, less, less uh, aggressive guitar. And yeah, yeah. Saxophone. Let's, let's listen to another one from uh, Army of God here. This is uh, uh, a song that I know made uh, incredible traction amongst churches in the late 80s, early 90s. This is uh, Salvation Belongs to Our God. For me, that brings me back to my childhood. Both those last two songs that we played, Jesus, Jesus, Glorious One, and Salvation Belongs to Our God, um, I got to know those songs first through the Petra Praise record. Yeah. <laughs> because I know that both of those um, were chosen. My understanding is that Petra came to somebody at Integrity and said, hey, can you give us some cassettes of what, what, what are some popular choruses being sung? in the church right now and they must have given them your recording of this because they chose both of those songs mm -hmm. uh did you ever hear the renditions that they did or did, did you ha ever have uh kind of am i telling the story correctly of how that came about uh, i did hear them i don't know how it came about i, I never worked for integrity i was just associated with so sure. i didn't know the ins and outs of projects but i, I did hear their versions of it and i was thrilled because that was Jesus, Jesus, Glorious One was Curtis Piper, a Canadian, by the way, who was oh, in, our, in our ministry. Uh, and uh, that was one of the songs that had to copyright. I was thrilled that they, they did it. And it went to more of a youth culture that might not have heard uh, the original. But um, yeah, the Salvation Belongs to Our God, I think, is a UK song. I think I heard that from somebody else or on a on a conference uh, tape or something like that somebody brought it to me uh, it was kind of funny when i was listening back to you i heard that little motif in there it sounds like cheers in the world today everything you got yeah what song cool. is it? what's that from that's the cheers that's that's oh, okay that's what i thought cheers. i wasn't sure of the lyrics but i, was like, I remember that yeah gotcha Man, yeah, Salvation Belongs to Her God, that, that song seemed to have some longevity. Was that one that you would often do when you yes, were leading worship? Yes, yes, absolutely. It was, a, it was one of those songs that's a great segue from energetic fast to more worshipful, mm. slow, because it's a medium tempo, but then you can be to a God, you can do it real slow. Yeah. Oh, I did it all the time. It was great. I don't know who wrote it. I don't remember, but it was a fantastic song. Yeah. Well, speaking of songs, what types of things do you look for when choosing songs for worship? Like, obviously, we've talked about these projects, but, you know, you, you for many years have, have been a worship leader. And, uh, you know, what, which of your songs that you've recorded with Integrity do you feel have had longevity? Uh, well, yeah, huh. a, a lot of them from Be Magnified. Uh, because I think by, by that time, more people were new of Integrity and company was growing and their songs were getting up but uh you know uh let's see glory to the king of kings i think that mm -hmm. was uh army of god i don't remember which album that was yeah army of god glory that was big uh mighty one of israel uh the whole medley of more love more power be magnified and stand up for jesus okay not the easiest for an average musician to pull off sure uh, that arrangement well, yeah, stand up stand up stand up for jesus like yeah. changes and all these hits <laughs> and borrowed chords and you know borrowing. your hand is like cramping well, no, up. <laughs> well what i did i was uh, i used to uh came up with a nickname i called myself captain capo because i just did the sliding capo you know it's kind of look this song's in trouble 
send in Captain Capo. Just, you know, because because Tom would do like four <laughs> modulations and every time he's changing the chord substitutions and all that. And I was determined to try to learn as much of that as I could. And, but uh, that was a great one. You know what they have those and they have those capos now that are on, on wheels on yeah. the, the neck and you can move them down before you had to like grasp them and oh am i am i on the right uh, am, I, am i putting it in the right spot you know oh no wrong one more <laughs> the problem with those i found i've had just about every capo you can imagine it's, it's really easy to go too far you go i want to go to the fifth fret and you're in the seventh real fast because you do it like in between strums you know yeah yeah wild wild um yeah, and, and just going back, what, what are some of the things that you look for when you're choosing songs yeah. to in worship? Uh, I look for, of course, something that, that says something, especially if it's it's really resonating with me because I'm the one leading it. It needs to be authentic coming from me. Hmm. But a, a simple song, not nursery rhyme simple, but accessible, easy to people to latch on to because the whole point of leading worship is that you're, wanting people to participate. Uh, not that you can't get something out of it, just casually observing and not participating all the time. But in general, the power is when collectively everybody's on the same page, singing the same words and in the same uh, zone and experiencing the same emotion. Mm. Uh, so I look for a song that's gonna facilitate that. And what I took me years and years and years to learn, but what I finally found out is that rather than come out of the gate just energetic like the first couple of records <laughs> would it would uh, suggest that i do is it it's more of like a slow boil you know you just kind of gather people introduce them focus them yeah. uh and bring them it's like garrett my friend he is a great illustration of, that i have borrowed maybe some would say stolen but uh it's a great illustration that what the role of a worship leader is we're like a butler yep I meet you at the door. Mm -hmm. You didn't come to see me, but I'm the, there to open the door, to welcome you, take your hat and coat, offer you a drink, bring you into the house, make you comfortable. And I ultimately lead you to the master of the house who you came to see. And then I fade out of the background. You're not there to see me. So my job is to take songs and serve them. It's like serving the hors d'oeuvre to bring people in, make them feel welcome and serve them, but bring them to who they came to see, which is Jesus. Connect their heart to him in some way, the best I can. And then and then, just keep keep the plate spinning, but fade out of the background. It's not about me. Now that's easier said than done, but that's a good uh, model and a good template to hold up. Because so often there's a part of us that really wants to put our imprint on everything so much that, you know, people walk out saying, no, you are fantastic, rather than saying, what a what an evening of worship. I really felt God moved in my heart. Who was it was leading? You know, that kind of, that's, that's more the compliment, right? So, uh, so I look for songs that will, will relate to, to me and relate to people and, and I try to slowly build a, an invitation or a, a, an entrance into the house, uh, so to speak. And, uh, give them just enough interest, but just enough simplicity that they can stay connected. Hmm. And, and it's a, the, the art of it is you got all these colors in your palette is knowing when to mix what. So sometimes you need a more complicated song, a more wordy song, a more, a more uh, theological song. But if they're all like that and too heady, you just lose about half the audience. And if they're all too simple, you lose it. So you, you know how to sprinkle in this and that, keep it moving along. That's, that's my great, approach. That's great wisdom. That's great wisdom. Another analogy I've heard before that's similar to the Butler one is the tour guide. And the mm -hmm. tour guide's always pointing to the thing that ought to have the focus. Mm -hmm. And the tour guide's never in the picture. You don't take pictures yeah. of the tour guide. You take pictures of the things that he's pointing to and he just kind of fades out of there. Yeah. That's but good. I, I love that. That's helpful. So 1990, Worship the King. A couple of years later, we're on this cycle with doing projects for integrity every couple of years, every year to two years. And I want to play a track off that. This is called We Believe off the Worship the King Project. <laughs>
So Randy, we finally escaped the militant themes <laughs> and we, and we have this, uh, worship the King record from 1990. Um, the one thing I noticed about this project is, uh, well, first let me talk about, we believe so a song by Graham Kendrick. And yeah. I noticed that you cut a couple of songs by Graham. My guess is that you may be identified with them as a, another acoustic guitar player, but just a plethora for those who don't know that name, you should go look it up right now. Yeah. Fantastic. There's, Fantastic, exactly. Fantastic songwriter. I, my exposure to that to that song was through the March for Jesus movement, which was huge in Canada, mm -hmm. and um, and a project Integrity did called Crown Him. Um, but d talk to me a little bit about your uh, you know your usage of some Graham Kendrick tracks on your on your records. Uh, well, first of all, I got to set up. You you notice a distinct difference in sound and everything on that record. Uh, I can hear you. And here's the background story. Um, this was one they didn't ask me to do it initially. This was already somebody else's project. They picked oh. the songs. They recorded the tracks. They were on the 11th and a half hour before, before sending this thing out. And, and an issue arose with the worship leader where they had to uh, ask him to step down and somebody else, they needed somebody to step in at the last minute. Oh, I see. And I got a call from Don Moen. He's like, oh, just explain the situation. He said, would you be willing to step in? I know they're not your songs, but would you be willing to? I was thinking, a third integrity project? Yeah, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> and uh, they said, so they FedExed me a cassette of the songs, and I listened, and I said, I like all the songs. that I don't remember what the first song was, not the one that's on there, but the first song that they had on it, I, I said, it doesn't really feel like something I would do, and I've got another song maybe, and I sent them the, the uh lift up your voices song which is a song that my keyboard player phil white and i had written and uh that that was the only imprint of me that's somebody else's record i stepped in to do it uh, that's why some of the songs don't exactly feel like what i would do but i tried to make them make them me the other thing you yeah. notice is that jeff hamlin produced it and those that was done in a nashville studio so oh, it's okay not tom brooks imprint you hear the guitar sound is different the mix yeah. is different and uh, different singers are different. Uh, so it was very different for me and it was fun for that reason. So I went to Nashville and recorded all the overdubs and everything and that was wow. fun. So another studio project. So um, when you were recording this, it was approached as a studio record. You, or did you have, did you do? No, no, no we did. I'm, I'm sorry, I misrepresent. So yeah, that was just the tracks. Then we went uh, to Mobile, Alabama, big Baptist church called Cottage Hill Baptist. Dr. Oh, okay. Fred, Fred Wolf was the pastor, real respected in town. That's where we recorded it. Steve Bowersox, I don't even know that name. He did the choir and background. And uh, uh, yeah, that was summer of 1990, I think, September of 1990. We did that. So, um, so, so what do you remember about the live recording of that night? And did you, was it a struggle at all to own that project because it, because of the circumstances to which you came into it? No, not really, because by the time you've, I think it was in March when they asked me to do this. So I've been listening to these songs. I made them mine, but I was just pointing out that I wasn't there and I didn't bring the songs when gotcha. I was choosing the songs, which yep. I, I love Graham Kendrick and I've, I've met him and I got a lot from, from him, but I wasn't instrumental in choosing that song for that project. I just was happy it was on there. Uh, uh, it's, it's just got a little different different twist not everybody would notice it but it's it's certainly different than the first two yeah uh, and it's, uh it feels like it's just another notch towards acoustic worship like you could you yeah. could see that there was change in the air and you know we'll talk about be magnified in a second but like by the time be magnified comes it's like okay worship is taking a yeah. different direction here in terms oh, and so i don't know who the acoustic guitar player is it's just probably a national studio guy i didn't play anything on that record i just sang on it it was a great night of recording a packed out church and a big choir and it was really fun i remember i led a set of worship before we started recording just to okay get used to get the crowd used to who, who i was and, uh it was fun. It was it was really good. I was happy to do another one and 